One is that you're here. And most importantly, the last one, which probably should be the first one, is that the Lord is here. Amen. 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 Now, I had a good breakfast this morning. But I didn't have lunch. And I didn't have dinner. And I have to make a confession tonight that when he's talking about five plates of ribs, I got hungry and I thought, man, I'd like to just have one. Not even one plate, just one rib. Is there any place I can get one on the way down? <laughs> McDonald's don't have the McRib. Of course, that's not real. They used to. That's not real spare ribs, but I sure like them from time to time. And I'm a blessed man. Um, I preached in the church Wednesday night. I did a funeral on Thursday at one o'clock. We had the bereavement dinner and I had to go to Flagstaff for an assignment up there. And then I had to drive from Flagstaff yesterday over to Prescott to do another funeral. And then I had to be back to the church by 6.30 last night for a group of teenagers who came for what we call pastor and pizza. We feed them pizza and then they ask questions. And I get to pour my life into those teenagers. And it's a wonderful thing. Amen. And then tonight I get to be down here. Tomorrow I will teach Sunday school and preach twice. My job is about to become one that is full time. Amen. But I'm blessed because to think that at 77 years of age, I can do this. The person that we buried on Thursday was 64, which was my wife's cousin. The man we buried yesterday in Prescott was 71. And here I am, 77, doing all these things. Amen. Amen. Looking for ribs. <laughs> and I really thank God for that because I know people that have always either complained or grumbled or, or talked about the fact that God wouldn't let them have anything to do, wouldn't give them a ministry. You know, I believe that a man's calling just makes room for itself. I, I want to talk to you about something tonight that is really heavy on my heart. I am not going to talk about politics except to say this, there is a trend today in politics that concerns me and disturbs me. It is the move to what is called progressivism. Progressivism. And I fear and I am concerned today about the fact that some of us have come to the place that we try to be so progressive that we're losing out on some of the precious realities of God. Now understand, I'm an old timer. Understand, my message does not change from year to year. In fact, my message is the same today as it was 54 years ago when I started. Amen. Now let me tell you what has 
birth some of this in my heart. Thursday was my dad's 110th birthday. Wow. <laughs> But it was his birthday. And as I thought about his birthday, I thought about all the precious things that that godly man imbued into my heart. And not only from him and from his lips and his words, but the atmosphere and the environment that he subjected me to from the time I was a baby, right on up until I got old enough to go away to college. Something was planted. Something was sown into my heart. And this week, God has been showing me how important that it is that we do not forsake those important principles of godliness and righteousness and scripture for down the pike fads and wingdings that people come up with. Amen? Amen. Now I want to tell you something. I want to tell you something. You say, well, you know, if there's any knock over the years it's been on my ministry, it has been the fact that I have not been progressive enough. That as one of our friends, and you know who I'm talking about, he says you're not relative for the generation that you live in. I said it don't matter whether I'm relevant or not. I want to tell you Jesus is relevant. And his word is relevant. And to me, that's what we need more than anything else. And it must not be too bad. Because after 52 years, I'm still pastoring a church. And after 54 years, I'm still in full-time ministry. Amen. Now, what I want you to do tonight is to open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. And we come to a beautiful portion of Scripture where John is dealing with some problems that occasioned the writing of this epistle. And you've got to remember that in verse 15 he said, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, these are not of the Father, but they are of the world, and the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now, we drop down to verse 20, and notice what it says. But ye have an unction. Now, I don't know whether you know what an unction is or not. Yes, sir. But an unction literally comes from the Greek word charisma, and it means an anointing. Now what John is saying to them, you have an anointing from the Holy One, and ye know all things. Wow, isn't that powerful? Ye know all things? Well, you say, Pastor Don, I didn't know that I was omniscient. I didn't know that I knew all things. Now, don't, don't go there, that's not where I'm going. And that certainly wasn't where John was going. But let me tell you what he meant when he said that. When he said, and ye know all things, that means that you know all things that pertain to salvation and what is required to be saved and the principles of godliness. And as Peter said, all things that pertain 
unto godliness, these are the things that you know. Now, isn't it strange that he's commending them for what they already know and sanctioning their knowledge of certain things. Now notice in verse 21, he said, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth. In other words, let me say to you tonight, I'm not preaching to you tonight because you don't know the truth. I believe that many of you know the truth in a very powerful and profound way. So he says, I have not written unto you because you know not the truth, but because you know it, and here's something that you need to know, that no lie is in the truth. Now, I don't know about you, but I get sick of dishonesty. Amen. I get sick of lying. And I wonder what the Lord thinks about that. Hold it, Pastor, it was just a little white lie. A lie is a lie. Come on, That's right. Come on, let's get off that stuff. And you know where liars are going to go? Yeah. All liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Amen. Now, the thing that is so stunning to me, that really stood out in my mind, he is saying here that there is no lie in truth, uh, and you know the truth, and that's not why I'm writing unto you, but I want to tell you there is a safety valve in truth. Do you realize that oftentimes that when we spout off at the mouth, when we open our mouths, we oftentimes show how little we know or how ignorant we may be in certain areas. But let me tell you something. Let me tell you something that's really important. Jesus Christ said, John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Let me tell you something. You talk about Jesus. When I was a child growing up in church, we used to sing a little chorus. Let's talk about Jesus. The King of Kings is He. The Lord of Lords Supreme. You know, when you talk about Jesus, you're talking about the truth. Hallelujah. Let's talk about the Word of God. The Bible says that Jesus prayed in John 17, 17, Sanctify them through the truth, for thy word is truth. If you want to be on safe ground, talk about the Word of God. Amen. Let's don't believe those scandal magazines. Let's don't bother with them. Let's become concerned about that which is God's Word. And the Bible tells us that we should always speak the truth in love. No matter how much it hurts, no matter how difficult it is, yes, I'm guilty. I did chop down that cherry tree. Yes, I'm guilty of it. I did this, Pastor. I am not ashamed to admit to you because I want it right before God, and I don't want my life moving on from one day to the next day with untruthfulness in me, with deception and lying in my heart. I want to live, and I want to walk in the truth. Come on. Hallelujah. 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 So in verse 21, John is saying, I write to you to confirm to you the truth that you already know. But listen to what else he's saying. I write to you to warn you against those who would seduce you. Amen, you got that? Those who would seduce you. Now verse 22, he said, who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. And, and there, you know, as you obviously know, there are many things that constitutes lying. Now, um, who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Now, in John's time when he was writing this epistle, I want you to understand that there were Gnostics who were coming and creeping into the church among the believers and filling their minds with things that were not true, such as they were saying that Jesus was not the truth. But I got news for you. Jesus is the truth, and I believe that it's important that that be our confession. For when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi in Matthew chapter 16, he asked men saying, Who do men say that I am? And Peter said unto him, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. 
Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Thou art the Messiah. Thou art the anointed one who is the Son of the living God. Now, the person that denies that does not know the truth, but John says in chapter 2, verse 22, that he is Antichrist. And you know what intrigued me with that? He didn't say he is of the spirit of Antichrist. He didn't say he was maybe another Antichrist or a forerunner. He said he is an Antichrist. You deny that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and the Bible says that you are Antichrist. And I believe that it's important that we understand that. Number two, the problem was that they were saying that God is not the Father of Jesus Christ. I want you to know that God was the Father of Jesus Christ because no man could be born the way he was born, conceived by the Holy Ghost of a virgin and bring forth a son who was capable of saving people from their sins. And so these people were saying, oh, he's not the son of God. Secondly, they were saying, oh no, God's not the father. And thirdly, they were saying that Jesus was not the son of God. See, not only did they say that he uh, uh, was not Christ, but they were saying that he was not the son of God. Now, in 1 John chapter 4, and just two chapters over, uh, John deals with the issue again. And I want you to notice what he said. He said, uh, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits and see whether or not they be of God. Because many false prophets have gone out into the land. And he said, And hereby we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that confesseth not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is not of God. You say, well, so what? I know a lot of religions in the world where they confess that he is. That he is Jesus. That he is, uh, uh, he really existed. No, that's not what he's talking about. What John is talking about when he says every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. That means that he was conceived by the Holy Ghost. That means that he was born of the Virgin. That means that he lived a sinless life. That means that he did no sin whatever. That means he suffered and died on the cross. That means that he was buried and rose again and ascended back to the Heavenly Father to be seated there in behalf of you and I and our needs. That's what it's all about for Jesus to have come in the flesh. Now, the plain truth. They don't confess that then they're antichrist. Verse 23. Whoso denieth the Son? Whoso denieth the Son? The same hath not the Father. Let me tell you. Jesus said, my Father and I are one. Now let me tell you something, church. If you deny the Son, then you don't have the Father. See, you need to understand that. We've got to understand that. Because it says that uh, uh, the same hath not the Father, but he that acknowledgeth the Son hath the Father also. And, and that word acknowledge. Huh. Oh, I don't know whether you can get a hold of this or not tonight. But what that word acknowledge means is to come into complete, full recognition of who Jesus really is. I want to tell you something that's wonderful to tell somebody that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is the Savior of the world. But I want to tell you tonight, church, that Jesus is so much more than that. And that word acknowledgeth means that you come more and more and more into the fullness of the revelation of who Jesus is. And that's what I'm doing down here whenever I come to try to help you understand more and more and more about who Jesus really is. Thank you. Hallelujah. I 
think you'll agree with me, won't you, that it's pretty good. We're getting down to the nitty gritty of this. When I talked to you about progressiveness earlier, look at verse 24. It says, let that therefore abide in you, which ye have from the beginning. And you know, I don't know how many times I've seen that. I've looked at that. But this week, that really captured my heart. Let that abide in you, which you received from the beginning. What I tell you about my dad tonight, because of what he taught me from the beginning. Amen. And I still live by that. Those fundamental principles of God's holy word, of righteousness and godliness to me are something that are so important. In other words, what John is saying here to the people who are being infested by these Gnostics, uh, he said, don't you give up what you believe. Don't you give up what you have been taught. Don't you turn your back upon that which you have heard. In other words, it is wrong for you to turn your back uh, and you need to remain faithful and true to that which you have been taught. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. You know what it means that let that therefore abide in you which you've heard from the beginning. Abide means continue. Let it continue. Don't be looking for some new crazy doctrine. Don't be looking for something that when God's word says no, you look for some kind of a teaching that will say yes for you to do whatever you want to do and give, give vent to the flesh. No. Abide, continue, remain, or dwell in that which you have heard from the beginning. Now, wow. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the straight teaching from the Word of God. You know what? I feel like Billy Graham. Billy Graham said one time, I'll go anywhere and I'll preach anywhere, providing there is no limitation on the message that I preach. See, if there was, I wouldn't be here tonight. I'm not going to waste my time with people that don't want to hear the truth of the Word. And it's so important that that which we have heard came straight from the Word of God and that we continue in it and that we don't lose it. Look at Colossians 1.23. If thou continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the gospel which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven. That doesn't sound like you need to be changing, does it? Abide in it. If you continue in it. 1 Timothy 2.15, talking about uh, the women. And it says that notwithstanding that the woman, she shall be saved in childbearing if she continue in the faith and charity with holiness and sobriety. Another great picture that we looked at. We learned how that Israel, who was the natural branch of the tree, was cut off because of their unbelief. Uh, and then we find that the church, uh, or, or the Gentile, was grafted in, and they became a partaker of the root and the fatness of the tree. Uh, and the, what did Paul say in Romans 11, 23? If you continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt be cut off. Church, I want to tell you what. Our Christian walk is a daily walk continuing in that which we heard from the beginning and not changing it, not altering it, because God's Word says that we are not to add to or we are not to take away from the teachings of God's Holy Word. Amen. Hallelujah. Verse 24 says that that which you've heard from the beginning shall remain in you. Ye shall also continue in the Father. 
Oh, I don't know about you, but I talked about my dad a while ago. He went to be with the Lord in 1977. And I still miss him. Because that relationship with the Father. And I could not stand to think about walking one day without a relationship with my Heavenly Father. Amen. And see here, that's what he says. <coughs> if that which was from the beginning, you continue in that. You will continue in your relationship with the Father and with His Son. Let me give you something here to think about before I start winding this up. In Jude, verse 3, Jude is writing there to an apostate people. And he said, I first thought that I would write to you of the common salvation. But he said, I feel like I need to write to you and exhort you that you earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And that word once means once and for all. The faith that was once and for all delivered unto the saints. That's what we should be living in and abiding in and continuing in that Hallelujah. which we heard from the beginning. Hallelujah. Now, let me tell you something. Book of Revelation chapters 2 and 3. There are seven churches that are mentioned. I have been to the scene of all seven of those churches. I found it interesting that every church site today reflects what the message of the angel was back then. For instance, Laodicea, the lukewarm church, the church that was rich and increased with goods, who said, now we don't have need of anything. And, and the angel said, I counsel you to buy of me gold that is tried in the fire because you need something other than earthly things. And then in verse 20, I want you to notice the picture. I don't know whether you've ever seen the artist's render called by Solomon, called Christ at Heart's Door. And it shows a door and a person inside the door and Jesus out here on the outside. Revelation 3.20 written below it. And it shows Christ knocking at the door of man's heart saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and I will sup with him and he with me. Oftentimes we think that that is just to an outright sinner. But let me tell you who that was to. That was to a church people who had pushed him out completely, who didn't continue in the thing that they started in, and Christ is trying to regain entrance back into their hearts and lives. We need to understand that. They didn't continue. And you know what? God said, you're lukewarm. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. I looked around the whole area of Laodicea, you know what? There's nothing there today. There's nothing there. Rocks, scorpions, nothing there. You know why? He spewed them out of his mouth because they did not continue in the things that they had heard. I make an appeal to you today. Every week you come to church, you have several services. Open your ears, open your heart, and listen to the Word of God that is taught to you. And I want to say to you that if you will continue in that which you have heard and not abandon it and forsake it, that you will walk in fellowship with the Father. Hallelujah. And with His precious the Lord. Do you want to continue? Yes. yes. I want to continue. Come on now, come on. I remember an old gospel song said we've come too far to turn back now. That's good. That's the way I feel. Amen. What is there to turn back to? You know, when the Israelites came out of Egypt, 
Oh, they started murmuring and complaining and saying, would it have been better if we just stayed down in Egypt? Let us go back to Egypt, the beggarly elements of the world, and sometimes you're probably tempted to want to go back to some of those beggarly elements of the world and some of those sinful patterns, but let me plead with you tonight. Let me appeal with you. Continue, continue in that which you have heard in order to walk in fellowship with the Father and with the Son. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Oh God, tonight, we thank you for your presence, your faithfulness, your goodness. Thank you, Lord, for the work of grace that there has been wrought in our hearts and lives. Thank you for this church. Thank you, Lord God, for what you're doing in their midst. Lord, thank you for Pastor Walt and his wife that pour their lives into these people week after week after week after week. Oh God, I pray tonight that there would be a new and a fresh determination that they would continue in that which they have heard from the beginning. Continue. Continue to abide in that glorious truth when they were set free a life in a world of sin. Move upon their hearts. Move upon this church. Oh God, let it be an outreach in this city like we have never even seen before or ever even dreamed of, oh God. Let it happen.